On this edition of Sightings, it may be history's most terrifying case of alien abduction. I was in a strange place, laying naked, paralyzed with this thing coming towards me. Were four men part of a bizarre extraterrestrial experiment? No doubt in my mind that they are being honest with me when they tell me that they were confronted by a phenomena. Then, inside the most haunted mansion in America. Based on a scale of 1 to 10, Valeroy probably hits 11. Plus, developing artificial intelligence, high-tech madness, or the next step in human evolution. You might eventually end up in a state where your whole brain has been replaced. Later, are guardian angels saving lives? I felt the lifting of his spirit. And new videotape from UFO hotspots around the world. It's got a characteristic that seems to defy conventional explanation. Welcome to Sightings. I'm Tim White. There's a pattern among people who claim that they've been abducted by extraterrestrials. Missing time, forced medical testing, and abject terror at the hands of their captors. For twin brothers in New England, their experience of abduction fits this pattern. But along with the terror, they are also manifesting strange new abilities they didn't have before. I'm not going in there. No, no f***ing way. Uh, just leave me alone. The implications, uh, according to a report by uh, Brookings Institute, uh, could uh, shatter the very foundations of not only uh, philosophy and religion, but uh, even science. Well, we were just a couple of guys camping, fishing, and we were excited about getting out of the city and being in the wilderness, going somewhere where we'd never been, getting some fishing done, paddling canoes. It was fun. That's the way it started out for four friends on a weekend fishing trip along Maine's Allagash River. Charlie Foltz, Chuck Rack, and twin brothers Jack and Jim Wiener were all art students together in Boston. The last thing on our minds was any UFOs or anything like that. We just wanted to go fishing. It was very, very dark. So we decided to build a fire so we could find our way back to our campsite. We built a huge fire. We built it to last several hours, because we expected to be out there fishing for several hours. You know, all four of us climbed in one canoe with our fishing equipment and headed out into the lake. Uh, we were out there for approximately 15 or 20 minutes fishing with no luck. <laughs> and um, suddenly, Chuck Rack said, hey guys, that's a heck of a case of swamp gas. And we turned around and a probably 150, maybe 200 yards away at the most, coming out of the trees was this huge ball of glowing, pulsating light. Uh, I remember it as being a very bright, round sphere of light that had kind of a uh, roiling quality to it. It was yellow-white in nature. Uh, it hovered totally silently over the tree hovering there above the trees, motionless. So we thought, well, it's obviously not an airplane because airplanes don't hover. So Charlie Fultz said, well, maybe we should signal it with a flashlight that we had with us. And we thought, well, sure, go ahead, signal it. You know, what's, what's going to happen? The minute he did that, as soon as he signaled it, it started moving towards us. The next thing I remembered was seeing the beam coming right towards the back of the canoe. And at that point, we started paddling very quickly towards the shore. As I was paddling, I was looking over my shoulder to see where this object was in relation to our canoe. And it kept just following us, coming closer and closer and closer. I was in a panic, to be honest with you. A second later, it was right, right on, almost on top of us with this beam coming across the water right towards our canoe. And I remember thinking, well, we're not going to outrun this thing. There's no way we're going to outrun this thing. And then the next thing I remembered was standing on the beach. No one remembers how they got to the beach. Strangely, their bonfire, which had been raging just a few minutes before, had completely burned out. The UFO was gone. Elapsed time, we thought, was 
15 or 20 minutes tops. And we couldn't understand why the fire had burnt down so soon. The four of us were just left there standing on the beach uh, in total silence. We, we didn't really even talk to each other. I guess we were in shock. The Allagash Four were baffled by the UFO and the apparent missing time. It was a mystery that would remain unsolved for more than 12 years until the Wiener brothers began having violent nightmares. Get away from me! And then I would wake up and I would be drenched in sweat and my heart would be beating really fast and it was, it was like a, a horrible, horrible nightmare and it kept recurring and recurring. I started having nightmares about being in some room or some area with uh, these strange creatures around and us. I said, I can't believe you're telling me this because I've been having the same dream. Jim went to a psychiatrist for help with his night terrors. His doctor referred him to Ray Fowler, an alien abduction researcher. I think that the Wieners opened Pandora's box because now they have questions about reality that they never had before. They have questions for which there are no answers. Each of the Allagash Four underwent hypnosis. Each was regressed separately, but all told the same story about what they had experienced in 1976. Their sessions were recorded. A beam is coming towards us. I don't know what it's gonna do. Uh, it makes me feel like I'm flying apart. I remembered um, a pressure, a, a heat of uh, my physical body being ripped to shreds, like on a molecular level. I mean, it's the only way I can verbalize it, but it is an extremely unpleasant feeling. It feels like death. I had no idea where I was. Then I realized that the three guys were sitting to my left on this bench, naked. All I knew was I was in a strange place, laying naked, paralyzed with this thing coming towards me. Creatures that I remembered they reminded me of bugs. No eyelids, they didn't blink. I remember um, these creatures examining my brother with a, uh, a type of wand, is what it appeared to me as. It was a long, thin instrument, maybe the diameter of a pencil, a uh, foot, a little over a foot long with a bulbous end on it. The next thing I remembered was they turned me over and then they were doing some type of anal exam and it terrified me. I remember them taking a sperm sample from me. They flooded my mind with images of lovemaking and um, sexual visions, which aroused me. But it was totally out of my control. The next thing I knew, we were standing on the beach. If their stories were true, the implications were astonishing. Fowler questioned the credibility of the witnesses. I wasn't surprised when he asked us would we be willing to take a polygraph test. I mean, I'd ask the same question. Ernest Reed, a licensed polygraph examiner for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, conducted the tests and interpreted the results. After administering the examinations, reviewing the charts in detail, after talking with both of the brothers, there is absolutely, positively no doubt in my mind that they are being absolutely honest with me when they tell me that they were confronted by a phenomena in the Allagash region. One person might fool a uh, polygraph examiner, but you have four uh, all uh, passing the tests and the polygraph examiner being convinced that all four are telling the truth is uh, very important. After the polygraph examination, the four friends felt vindicated. The truth of their experience had been recorded. Chuck Rack and Charlie Foltz moved on. They are trying to put the experience behind them. But for Jim and Jack Wiener, their abduction experience was just beginning. The first-hand accounts and polygraph results of the Allagash Four provide compelling evidence that these men experienced extraterrestrial abduction. But there's more. The Wiener brothers believe that strange new abilities in art and mathematics are further evidence of their abduction. Next, more than a decade after their abduction, haunting memories resurfaced and their lives changed dramatically. My artwork changed immediately and very drastically. Nearly 20 years ago, four friends went on a canoe trip up the Allagash River. When they returned home, they had a whopper of a fish story. But in this case, the one that got away was an extraterrestrial spacecraft. It was an unbelievable tale of fear, abduction, and missing time. But 
when the men voluntarily took polygraph examinations, science said they were telling the truth. I thought I was nuts. That was my first comment was, I must be nuts. I must be going crazy. You know, there's something wrong with me. This, this, doesn't, this isn't about abduction. This is about some kind of brain disorder. Anything but that. I mean, just tell me I'm insane or tell me I'm hallucinating, but UFOs, you've got to be kidding. It took me a while to, to realize that I have to deal with this. It did happen. Researcher Ray Fowler's study of the twins' experience is chronicled in this book, The Allagash Abductions. The Allagash Abduction uh, exhibits the typical characteristics of many, many other sightings uh, and abductions that we've investigated. And I, I feel very strongly that uh, what they uh, described is a real experience. The first tangible evidence that Jim and Jack were experiencing a real phenomenon was the strange and sudden change in their artwork immediately following the Allagash incident. I started out as a very traditional painter. I was interested in landscapes, still lives. I did a lot of pretty ordinary paintings. Then, immediately after the abduction, I became interested in mathematics and science and physics and all this stuff, all of a sudden I became obsessed and it started, I started working it into my artwork. And I had no idea why. I used to constantly ask him what exactly was going on here and he would always say, I have no idea. This is just what's coming out. And I don't know why, why I'm doing this or what it means, but here it is. It meant something, but I couldn't put my finger on it. It just seemed out of, just out of my grasp, but I felt compelled to do it. Jim also began working in a new and spontaneous artistic direction. Neither twin understood the force that was driving him. Immediately after the uh, sighting incident in 76, uh, I started seeing things differently, as if I was being programmed. My artwork changed uh, immediately and very drastically. I was a clay worker, and I had been doing very traditional type of pottery, plates, uh, pitchers, saucers. Looking back on it, I would say it was uh, fairly mediocre in design. Immediately after the uh, event in, on the Allagash, uh, my artwork changed drastically. I started doing uh, very bizarre structural pieces. I mean, you, you become obsessed with these things. You, you don't eat, you don't sleep, you just work. After the brothers began hypnotherapy and started recalling their abductions, they used their artistic gifts to illustrate their experience. After the hypnosis sessions were over and I'd come home, I'd go into my studio and just draw what I remembered. It was an amazing process. Some of the uh, artwork that I've done since the abduction has encompassed images that for me try to describe what it felt like to be in this beam of light and this feeling of being disembodied are being torn apart atom by atom. And nearly 20 years after the Allagash encounter, Jim is still struggling. I feel like I'm doing a fairly good job on a day-to-day -day basis, but obviously I'm having a hard time unconsciously because I'm still having horrible nightmares where I seem not to be able to deal with these things. Jim and Jack both believe the nightmares continue because they are still being abducted. The brothers believe that Allagash was just the beginning of an ongoing series of terrifying alien encounters. It's not over. This is an ongoing thing. We're, we're basically, we're tagged. I mean, my impression was that they were scientists here doing a job. I feel that I'm part of an ongoing study. There's nothing I can do to change that. I have to accept it. Otherwise, well, what can I do? Go hide? They're going to find you. Now, the implications behind an experience like this means that something from somewhere else at their own whim at any time or any place can take you or I uh, without our consent, uh, without any protection from our government, and perform uh, experiments on us without us having anything to say about it at all. When Jack and Jim Weiner were children, they claimed to have had repeated contact with a strange apparition they called Harry the Ghost. But when they told their family about Harry the Ghost, he was laughed off as an imaginary playmate. The twins insist that Harry the Ghost was real and now believe that he was part of a series of early childhood 
abductions. Next, will human beings be the ultimate victims in the quest to create artificial life? We may have to face some sort of confrontation between man and machine. In 2001, A Space Odyssey, writer Arthur C. Clarke envisioned a future in which computers were capable of intelligent, independent thinking. With the ability to think for itself, HAL decided that humans were obsolete and eliminated them. Well, the year 2001 is fast approaching, and scientists warn that real computers like HAL will meet us there. In the fictional world of Dr. Frankenstein, the recipe for creating human life was simple. Combine various body parts, add electricity, and stir. It's alive! It's alive! That was then. This is now. Today's Frankenstein's monster is literally the brainchild of the computer revolution. In less than 50 years, we've learned how to build its body out of wire and steel, robotic arms, laser fingers, artificial human organs. But unlike its predecessor, this monster will soon have a brain. With the microchip, functions that once took a room full of computers can be performed in the space the size of a human skull. In computer laboratories throughout the world, the mandate is clear. Build a mechanical brain that thinks like a human. I think people really don't have a clue about the kind of revolution that we're talking about when we talk about a computer revolution. David Friedman is a science writer and technology magazine editor who tries to look beyond the burgeoning computer revolution and see what its implications are for the future. We're starting now to actually build machines that are like brains, that are organic, that are made out of the same materials that brains are made of. And scientists are beginning to do this right now and already are beginning to find some very, very interesting results. It's called artificial intelligence. Instead of simply calculating numbers and processing words, computers are being programmed to think and then put their thoughts into action. It's going to be possible to buy a robot, take it out of the box, and show it how to clean your house. Hans Moravec is one of the world's foremost authorities on the merging of artificial intelligence and robotics. He is on the leading edge of technological advancements in the field as director of the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. The pace of automation is going to accelerate dramatically uh, to the point where most companies will have essentially no human beings in them at all. Given the current rate of advancement, Moravec believes many humans will be obsolete by the end of the next century. By about 2050, as I, as I think, they'll be better across the board, or at least equal to us in the things we do very best. And by 2070, they'll be better across the board. When thinking automatons take over the work of the world, humans will have to create a completely new role for themselves. You will no longer be defined by your job, because you will no longer have one. So the luxury level of the retired human beings could, could be uh, very, probably very high, much higher than, than anything we imagine now. But while we relax in this so-called lap of luxury, who's minding the store? It's possible that someday we may have to face some sort of confrontation between man and machine. Sound far-fetched? Consider this current experiment being conducted by Japan's leading robotic engineer. He's taken uh, brain cells, living brain cells, and he's found ways to grow them actually on electronic chips. It's the ultimate merging of man and machine. The distinction between what a human being can do and what a machine can do will essentially evaporate. And in this country, artificial intelligence experiments are also blurring the distinctions between man and machine. He fills a beaker up with certain kinds of chemicals and it starts to, in a way, take on a lot of the characteristics of life. Are these computer breakthroughs occurring without consideration of the consequences? Is science out of control? What we're talking about is computers that become our friends, become our workmates, possibly become our bosses, and it's even possible to imagine ways in which computers can be lovers. It should be possible for a human person to augment their brain, augment their body, perhaps completely robotize themselves. And if you imagine just doing that piece by piece as things need to be replaced, you might eventually end up in a state where your whole brain has been replaced. 
if we lose control over these machines, uh, it's certainly possible that these machines will not see much of a need for mankind and perhaps uh, in a more frightening sense may in fact decide that we're dangerous to them. Uh, in that case, we'll have to look at a possibility, a, a future, where machines become very, very interested in eliminating mankind. These are not the doomsday predictions of one alarmist. Many scientists share Freeman's opinion and his projected timetable. A good guess might be 50 years. It's impossible to know where we will be 50 years from now. We can only look back and see how far we've come. We're just going to have to face this kind of future with the hope that it's one that will make the world a better one for us, but with the knowledge that, in fact, it's one that could eliminate us from the future. Your life, as it has been, is over. Whether or not we like the idea of computers imbued with artificial intelligence, they're coming. Our challenge is to make sure that this new technology is used to enhance life, not destroy it. Coming up, inside the most haunted mansion in America. When you're alone here or it's quiet, it's like no other place. In the inner world here is very, very different. Then, do guardian angels save lives and startling UFO home videos? Balleroy is an historic mansion in Philadelphia that just may be the most haunted place in America. Balleroy is owned by 76-year-old millionaire George Meade Easby, a philanthropist, a fine art collector, and a firm believer in the existence of ghosts. Easby and dozens of visitors to his home have seen, heard, and photographed hundreds of haunting events. I will never forget the first time I walked into the front doors of Balleroy and the first words out of my mouth were, my God, I can't believe how many spirits are in this house. Living here is really an adventure, I feel. And you never, you're never quite sure what's going to happen. It was more a sense of energy absolutely overtaking my body. It was like an electrical charge. The 30-room mansion was completed in 1911 in an era when great houses were given great names. This one, outside Philadelphia, is named Balleroy. It's a treasure house of early American furniture, art, and silver, and a treasure house for paranormal activity as well. But the source of the haunting here, according to ghost researchers, is not the house itself, but the spiritual energy emanating from the objects within it objects that were part of some of the most dramatic moments in history. When you walk into a place like Balleroy, and you see this silver that was used for the meal while the gentlemen who were signing the Declaration of Independence were ready to sign, you certainly have to pull some wonderful energy from something like that. Psychic Judith Richardson Hames believes that these historical objects are supernatural magnets, drawing in and holding fast to spiritual energy from the past. It is this spiritual energy that many people at Balleroy have experienced as a haunting. For me being a contractor working in a lot of other places, then coming here to Balleroy, it seemed really strange. But we have had um, all kinds of different encounters. Footsteps, cold drafts, doors opening, ashtrays moved from one side to the other side. We were here working one day doing something, and we heard a loud crash. We found a painting had come off the wall and gone 10 or 15 feet across Second Hall, and the nail was tight in the wall, and the wire was tight on the painting. In addition to residual haunting from the energy attached to inanimate objects, Hames and George Meade Easby also believe that Balleroy is haunted by ghosts. The sudden apparition of a woman has terrified many visitors. They have all had the same experience of seeing this woman dressed at the turn of the century that we now know as Amanda. We started to go through the house level by level. And for some reason, uh, my wife and I became separated from the rest of the group. We wound up on the third level. And as my wife and I were passing an open door on the third level, there was a dress form in the room. And when my wife saw it, she thought that was Amanda and let out a scream, <laughs> which kind of sent us to the end of the corridor where there was a closed door. And while we were standing there, there was a, a definite rap on the door. And I leaned over the railing and I, I asked Mr. Easby, I said, is there anyone in this room? And he said, no. Paranormal investigator Elliot Alexander claims that he has made contact with Amanda and that she could become a dangerous force in the house. 
there were a few times that I was here late at night when I became terribly, terribly frightened because there seemed to be a malevolent energy of some sort. And the very first time that I was here, I looked through those blue room doors. It was dark, but I saw what looked like blue smoke. And he said, now, how can we have fog inside like that? He said, it must be very damp. And I tried to explain to him that that was not fog. According to Easby, the fog is actually ectoplasm, residue left behind by the ghosts of Battle Roy. There are many photographs taken over the last 20 years that capture the strange fog. I really feel there is a presence here. And when, you, <clears throat> when you're alone here or it's quiet, it's like no other place. The whole world outside is blocked out, but the in inner world here is very, very different. Quiet and peaceful, Battle Roy stands frozen in time. And that may explain why one particular apparition has never wanted to leave. We were in the courtyard, and I had noticed an object looking at the window at me. And I had said to um, my buddy, I said, look at that. It's a little guy looking at us. A young kid, I'd say about, oh, I guess 10 maybe at the most, maybe eight. And I feel that that must have been my brother. When my brother and I first arrived here at Balleroy, we looked in a fountain out front. And I saw my reflection in it, but instead of his reflection was a skeleton. And that really was very unnerving. And shortly after that, he died. Whether that was a warning that he was going to, it could have been. George Easby's brother is not the only member of the family who seems to have reached out from the grave. Judith Richardson Hames believes she was contacted psychically by Easby's mother. One evening, on my way here to have dinner, I kept hearing the name Longfellow. And uh, she asked me if it meant anything. And I said, well, it does, because my mother's favorite poem was Children's Hour, which uh, Longfellow wrote. So we looked in the bookcase, and we found one book sticking out. When he opened it, it fell open to the Children's Hour, and stuffed in that page, was an envelope that said to Meade in the event of my death. From that point forward, it seemed as though Meade's mother wanted to use me to get messages to him. Hames is continuing her psychic investigation of Battle Roy. This kind of supernatural sleuthing may seem decidedly non-traditional, but George Meade Easby believes that respect for ghosts and spirits is part of the Easby family tradition. Its roots can be traced back to this letter, written by Easby's father shortly before his death. And my father left a note for me to read after his death, and he said uh, he had seen it for, and for me not to be afraid of it. I was brought up to not believe in ghosts. And um, when it happens in front of you and around you, and many of your friends see it, it has to be there. George Easby also told sightings that his mother's ghost instructed him to break open a cabinet that had been locked since her death. Inside, Easby found intriguing clues that led him to the will of his great uncle. Easby discovered that he was the rightful heir to a valuable piece of property no one but his great uncle and his mother ever knew about. Next, guardian angels saved his life and gave him hope for the future. They told me to paint 2,000 angel paintings by the year 2000. They would give me the art technique to do this. When Andy and Chantal Lakey first met in 1991, it was love at first sight. There was a deep bond that drew them together and continues to unite them today. They believe that the bond exists because before they met, Andy and Chantal each had a profound, angelic experience. This symbol appears in every work of art that Andy Lakey creates. It is the reason he paints, because Andy Lakey believes that it is his mission to share this symbol with the world. Angel. Angel, that's my angel, right. Let me show you how to follow the angel. Here's the head. Feel the head? Lakey uses heavy applications of acrylic paint so that everyone can feel the angelic power present in his life. So you go like this. This is the way you do it, with, with your hands like this. See? With your fingers, put your fingers up. There you go. See, so you can touch. 
My paintings are very thick, they're very textured. It's what most people would call a relief painting. And it's applied in such a way that blind people are able to participate in the art experience. And the angels are flying. The angels that Lakey feels compelled to paint are not the result of an artist's imagination. They are representations of what Lakey claims he actually saw one desperate night nine years ago. That vision changed his life, his art, and he believes his destiny. And his wife Chantal wears the angelic symbol on a chain around her neck because she too was touched by angels. It happened in 1978 when a tragic accident claimed the life of her fiance. Dale and I were in love and we had just gone from San Diego to Oregon to meet his cousin. It was a time in our lives when we were very, very happy and, and everything was exciting. We were exuberant about life and had a real zest for living it to the fullest. This was the view the lovers saw from the Oregon shore. Dale wanted to climb to the top of the promontory. Of course, I just had to do that because whenever Dale gave me a challenge, I would go for it. Locals knew the precipitous 500-foot climb to Lookout Peak was dangerous. Dale and Chantal did not. It was quite a climb to the top of the cliff, and I was the first one who made it to the top with him, and he was very excited, and I was very excited, and the view was breathtaking. But then they made a critical error. They decided to climb down along a different path. I couldn't believe the situation that we were in, and, and I didn't know how it happened, and I didn't know how we'd get out of it. And Dale said to me, I'm gonna go down before you, and I'm gonna help you, so why don't you let me inch my way down, and then you do whatever I do and follow me exactly. Those were Dale's last words. And I remember screaming, Dale, oh my God, Dale and someone help me, help me, help me. But there was no one there to help me. Paralyzed by fear, Chantal clung to the rock face. And it was then that I started to hear a soft singing and the singing started off very, very softly. It sounded like a chorus of hundreds and hundreds of angels. And they gave me the confidence to make my first move and to start inching my way down that cliff. I made it down to, I'd say, the first 300 feet. And it, I was about 100 feet up, and I started to fall. I lost everything. I lost, I lost my grip. And I started to, to slide and to free fall, and, and it was like I couldn't stop. And it was at that point that it was as if a hand, a powerful force, just reached up and grabbed me against my chest and, and slapped me against the, the, the rock again, and I just stopped falling. Chantal believes that the angelic power guided her down the last 200 feet of the cliff to the beach below. There, she found Dale's lifeless body. I went over to Dale, and I kissed him on the lips. I don't know why, I just, it was like a goodbye kiss, even though I knew that his body, and I felt that his body was just a shell at this point, and I felt the lifting of his spirit, and I felt the angels all around Dale, and the singing became louder again. Lookout Rock is a sheer and vertical cliff. There's absolutely no way that anyone could traverse up or down this cliff. It's just not gonna happen. But it did happen. The angelic experience spared Chantal and also transformed her. It was a transformation she would later share with Andy Lakey, who had experienced his own angelic vision. His angels appeared on New Year's Eve, 1986. By his own admission, Andy Lakey was addicted to cocaine, and that night, he'd been on a binge. I felt my body shutting down, and I felt paranoid, I felt embarrassed. I felt like if I was going to die, I wanted to die alone. And all I knew is I wanted to get near water. So I crawled to the shower, turned the shower on, and walked and pulled myself into the shower with water going all over my face, hair down my clothes. And I started to pray to God for the first time since I was eight years old that if he'd let me live, not only would I quit doing drugs, it's easy to say that at that moment, but I'd do something to help mankind and a twirling sensation almost instantly started to happen. 
In the shower, these figures were twirling around my feet and they were coming up in such a rapid pace and they were twirling around me that these seven figures turned into one and they put their arms around me. The figures looked like there was two arms or stubs that were sticking out with a head that was elevated above the body with just a very narrow, smooth torso. Lakey believes that these amorphous figures were angels sent to give him a second chance and that they ask for something in return. Lakey must make their presence known to the world, so he quit his job and started painting. With no formal art training, somehow he just knew how. They told me to paint 2,000 angel paintings by the year 2000. They would give me the art technique or the knowledge to do this. Andy Lakey paints in a way that makes the visual medium accessible to everyone. When a group of visually impaired children visited one of his exhibitions recently, Andy used his artwork to make a personal connection with this child. How are you? Yeah. How are you? I'm doing fine. You like the painting? Yeah. And it was through his art that Andy met and fell in love with his wife, Chantal. They believe that angels have created a spiritual bond between them and that angels continue to transform their lives. We're not here alone. We're all here to help each other and to love each other. There's a lot of hope out there. A lot, a lot of hope. Way to the top. Yeah. You like that? Yeah. <laughs> Andy Lakey has just been commissioned to paint Angel number 1,000. When he completes this painting, he'll be exactly halfway to his goal of painting 2,000 angels by the year 2000. And he'll be right on schedule. Next, startling activity at UFO hotspots around the world, captured on tape. Allegedly, this was shot at by Russian artillery. I simply can't guess as to where they come from. Sightings has received a number of home videos from viewers. Most of these tapes can be explained by our experts as aircraft or natural phenomena. But a few do remain unidentified. Although the sightings are too brief to allow for a definitive explanation, these home videos offer a unique glimpse of what our viewers are seeing every night of the year. 911, what are you reporting? Um, what the hell is that? It's not a helicopter because I can't hear it. Put my camera on, he says, oh, I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. Every amateur home video submitted to sightings asks the same questions. What are they? Where did they come from? And where are they going? The answers have yet to be found. Before the advent of home video technology, the government did try to find an answer. But of the 12,618 cases investigated by Project Blue Book, 701 remain a mystery. Project Blue Book ended in 1969, but the sightings have not. Thousands are reported each year, many to the sightings offices. Recently, several videos arrived from one area of northern Michigan. There's been a lot of speculation why Michigan. Michigan has historically had an extremely high percentage of reported UFO sightings in the United States. Approximately 7.05 that morning, I received a call from this female who identified herself as Tracy Shada and she I could tell the tone of her voice she was quite quite frightened. Uh, it took about three or four times to ask him what the complaint was about before he told me it was a UFO reported. When we sent a team to investigate state troopers Gouldner and Lasky told us that in their 20 years on the force they've received hundreds of UFO calls. 99% of the time you take it as a somebody who sees a bright light up in the sky. Personally, I felt there's, there's definitely something there. This lady is not telling some concocted story. I'm guessing it was two to three times the size of my barn. And as the object appeared to be moving away, I got real scared. Uh, there's things out there that are unexplained. And this is one of them. Home video shot by viewer Richard Almeida alerted us to an unexplained sighting in the skies above Sacramento, California. I called FAA in the morning and told him what we encountered. And uh, he said that, uh, that they didn't pick up anything on radar. And that was it as far as that conversation went. 
Home videos like those from Michigan and Sacramento are analyzed by photographic and aeronautic experts. Sophisticated computer technology compares and contrasts UFO images with those of known aircraft. Photo analyst Jeff Senio interpreted the Sacramento video. You see a dot in the sky, which in itself could be a star. It's really difficult to tell from the video itself, but more interestingly, another light comes up from below it. Because the images themselves are so minute, the flight pattern and velocity of the UFO become critical to the analysis. The important thing we get from this graph is that the apparent speed here appears to double in the 11 seconds that we see this thing. That's quite possibly simply because it got closer to us. So what kind of object gets twice as close to us in 11 seconds and you still can't make out what its shape is? It's still just a dot. And so this video I, I simply can't identify. It's, it's got a characteristic that uh, seems to defy conventional explanation. In Aliso Viejo, California, viewer Dale Newcomb shot this video of what he describes as a flying saucer. Analysis proves otherwise. Here's a freeze frame of the object that was seen in Lisa Viejo. Very classic saucer shape there. The giveaway, here we're seeing it go out of focus. The giveaway we see is the uh, FAA compliant anti-collision strobe lighting. You'll see a flash on the bottom and the top of the object every once in a while. It's the giveaway that these are uh, rather startling looking, but conventional advertising balloons. Senio is a staff analyst with MUFON the Mutual UFO Network. As the leading independent UFO organization, MUFON also receives many videotapes, including this one from Griesfeld, Germany, that had the military very concerned. There was a case of uh, multiple lights in the sky, hundreds of witnesses, uh, objects joining and leaving uh, a main group of objects. I think the sighting went on for well over an hour. Uh, allegedly, this was shot at by uh, Russian artillery and uh, witnesses saying that these things flew off at very high speed. Uh, I simply can't guess as to where they come from. With the advent of home video technology, the number of documented UFO sightings has risen dramatically, but the percentage that can be explained has not risen. Ironically, the more unidentified flying objects amateur ufologists capture on tape, the greater the mystery becomes for professional analysts. Having any kind of evidence, including videotape and still photos, really increases um, the acceptability, um, the acceptance of the fact that there is definitely something going on. If you see a UFO and you have a video camera ready, here's an important suggestion. Try to keep the camera steady. Avoid panning back and forth or zooming in and out. And if at all possible, try to include some other object, like a tree or building in the frame. This way, analysts can better... Sightings has expanded its America Online area. Keyword sightings when you log on for access to sighting stories, images, and events. To subscribe to America Online, call 1-800-591-3344. And you can still reach sightings 24 hours a day at 1-900-933-7444. Until next time, remember, no mystery is closed to an open mind. For sightings, I'm Tim White. Welcome to Sightings. I'm Tim White.
There's a pattern among people who claim that they've been abducted by extraterrestrials. Missing time, forced medical testing, and abject terror at the hands of their captors. For twin brothers in New England, their experience of abduction fits this pattern. But along with the terror, they are also manifesting strange new abilities they didn't have before. I'm not going in there. No, no f***ing way. Uh, just leave me alone. I don't believe it. The implications, uh, according to a report by uh, Brookings Institute, uh, could uh, shatter the very foundations of not only uh, philosophy and religion, but uh, even science. I'm paddling very quickly towards the shore. As I was paddling, I was looking over my shoulder to see where this object was in relation to our canoe. And it kept just following us, coming closer and closer and closer. I was in a panic, to be honest with you. A second later, it was right, right on, almost on top of us with this beam coming across the water right towards our canoe. And I remember thinking, well, we're not going to outrun this thing. There's no way we're going to outrun this thing. And then the next thing I remembered was standing on the beach. No one remembers how they got to the beach. Strangely, their bonfire, which had been raging just a few minutes before, had completely burned out. The UFO was gone. Elapsed time, we thought, was 15 or 20 minutes, tops. And we couldn't understand why the fire had burnt down so soon. The four of us were just left there standing on the beach uh, in total silence. We, we didn't really even talk to each other. I guess we were in shock. On this edition of Sightings, it may be history's most terrifying case of alien abduction. I was in a strange place laying naked, paralyzed with this thing coming towards me. Were four men part of a bizarre extraterrestrial experiment? No doubt in my mind that they are being honest with me when they tell me that they were confronted by a phenomena. Then, inside the most haunted mansion in America. Based on a scale of one to 10, Valeroy probably hits 11. Plus, developing artificial intelligence, high-tech madness, or the next step in human evolution. You might eventually end up in a state where your whole brain has been replaced. Later, are guardian angels saving lives? I felt the lifting of his spirit. And new videotape from UFO hotspots around the world. It's got a characteristic that seems to defy conventional explanation. That's a heck of a case of swamp gas. And we turned around and of probably 150, maybe 200 yards away at the most, coming out of the trees was this huge ball of glowing, pulsating light. Uh, I remember it as being a very bright, round sphere of light that had kind of a uh, roiling quality to it. It was yellow white in nature. Uh, it hovered totally silently over the tree hovering tops. there above the trees motionless so we thought well it's obviously not an airplane because airplanes don't hover so charlie fault said well maybe we should signal it with the flashlight that we had with us and we thought well sure go ahead signal it you know what's what's going to happen the minute he did that as soon as he signaled it it started moving towards us the next thing i remembered was seeing the beam coming right towards the back of the canoe. And at that point, we start. You know, we were just a couple of guys camping, fishing, and we were excited about getting out of the city and being in the wilderness, going somewhere where we'd never been, getting some fishing done, paddling canoes. It was fun. That's the way it started out for four friends on a weekend fishing trip along Maine's Allagash River. Charlie Foltz, Chuck Rack, and twin brothers Jack and Jim Wiener were all art students together in Boston. The last thing on our minds was any UFOs or anything like that. We just wanted to go fishing. It was very, very dark. So we decided to build a fire so we could find our way back to our campsite. We built a huge fire. We built it to last several hours because we expected to be out there fishing for several hours. You know, all four of us climbed in one canoe with our fishing equipment and headed out into the lake. Uh, we were out there for approximately 15 or 20 minutes fishing with no luck. <laughs> and um, suddenly Chuck Rack said, hey guys, 